Christmas. Um, I've done three. I've really enjoyed doing them because they've really made me think in, in how I'm going to present my ideas to you. Um, so this will be my last as it happens. Um, and I hope you enjoy it. I hope you get something out of it. Um, it's set up a bit like a lecture, which is a bit ironic given some of the things that I'm going to be talking about. If you've got a burning question during it, then just put your hand up and we can, uh, I can attempt to answer it. Um, and yes, I, I hope you find this interesting. So the first thing to say is that uh, none of this is new or my own. These two books form the backbone of everything that I'm going to say in this talk, actually. And they're both uh, authored by a guy called David Didow, who's very prolific on Twitter, if you're on Twitter. Um, and just write such good stuff, including an amazing blog um, where I find loads and loads of really good stuff. And he's not, by the way, a way out maverick um, oddity. He's backed up by lots of quite established educationalists as well, as I'll show you later uh, in, in this presentation. So um, although some of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about might seem a little bit con controversial to you, actually it's fairly mainstream and there's been a, a, a kind of shift in the UK back to this sort of thinking. So that's the context of it. So um, a couple of weeks ago we were sent around as staff in good faith you know, a very well-meaning, a video from the World Economic Forum, and it was typical of all these videos. It was set to rousing music. Um, it had inspirational panning shots of kids. And the slides, which I've just taken stills from, said things like this. It was all about what we need to teach children in the future. So this is what we need to do, to do tomorrow. They need to, we need to develop their creativity muscles, said the video. They're likely to have jobs that require a higher share of creativity than ever has been in the past. And they're going to need to learn resilience, mastery, collaboration. And if we're not doing that, we're failing them. So on the face of it, there's nothing in that video that uh, people would disagree with. It sounds really, really plausible that we should be teaching kids resilience, mastery, collaboration, and so on. And that if we're not doing that, we're failing them. But I take issue with that video, unusually. And um, the reason is that you can't teach those things in isolation. So one of the things that I'm going to try and convince you of in this lecture is that there is no such thing as being able to teach creat creativity in isolation. You can't teach resilience in isolation. It just can't be done. Um, so some of those things are to do with people's character. What are they like as people? And of course the problem with deciding as a school that what we're going to do here is we're going to hone children's character is what aspects of character do we hone in on? Yeah, there are loads and loads of different aspects of character. Who decides which trait to pick? Is being an introvert allowed? Because that's a character trait. And um, there are some exponents of character education that say no it's not. You're not allowed to be introverted because extroverts do better in life which I find a bit problematic. Some of you may have introverted children. They have a place in the universe. Um, if we try and drum out them being introverted, we, it, it won't be possible in the first place, um, but it's, I don't think it's very healthy. And then the second thing is, what if, the, if bad character traits are good? So for example, agreeableness doesn't do you very well in the world. Yeah? People who are less agreeable seem to have higher earnings potential, unfortunately. So should we be teaching our kids to be difficult little sods? Yeah? Because they'll get uh, higher earning potential, and clearly that isn't the case. And look at all of these things that we might have to teach if we decided we were going to focus on character. It'd just be impossible. The curriculum would be so crammed that we couldn't do it. Um, also, a lot of these things overlap on the personality spectrum, and it's just a fact that aspects of your personality are just genetic. You can't do anything to change them. I was really interested to read that psychopaths, about one in ten men are psychopaths and slightly less females. Them being psychopaths has nothing to do with their upbringing, with the fact that they had adverse childhood experiences. They're just born like that. Now, of course, not all psychopaths go on to murder and so on. But we all know people who are kind of immune to other people's emotions. And it may well be that they are psychopaths. Yeah? 
They just don't go around killing people. But they, they just don't care about what other people think about them. Um, and they, they, they're probably somewhere on this spectrum. Um, so there's a limited amount we can do here. We can't unlearn people's genes. Um, and character is in any case dependent on our context. In some situations, if you're an agreeable person, you'll be agreeable. But there are times when even the most agreeable amongst us aren't very agreeable. And it's to do with the situation that we're in. Very often we're more concerned with what we look like to other people than actually what we should be doing. And that's really surprising. You may think that you behave in a certain way because it's the right way to behave. But actually research has been done into this. And all of us are really, really prone to falling into what other people think about us. So, for example, some research was done, this is explained down at the bottom, on people who report having high self-esteem. So they say, I have high self-esteem. Whatever other people think of me, I have high self-esteem. And they were then shown um, videos of themselves being uh, reacted to negatively by other people and their reported self-esteem declined. So it's a very, very uh, difficult area to get into. And the point is that if we start honing in on character education as the key to unlocking children's uh, future potential, it, we're following a red herring. Um, so just to summarize these, David Didow basically says, don't get distracted by all that. Focus on doing what's normal in school. Basically, if we get children to struggle in class with troublesome concepts, to work hard, to realize that they can't have everything just now to delay their gratification, um, they will, we will simultaneously and implicitly be developing their character without having to explicitly teach it, which, as I've explained, is virtually impossible anyway. Best way to teach resilience is to give children challenging work to do. It's as simple as that. I can't have a resilience lesson. I wouldn't know what to do in it. I can, however, teach a computing lesson in which there's some hard stuff. And as a byproduct, the children get better at being resilient. Um, you sometimes hear this as well. Uh, well, OK, so it sounds like you're advocating for a more knowledge-based curriculum. But what's the point in knowing anything when you can just go away, go away and Google it? I've mocked up this little meme showing our uh, hard-working logo being squashed by Google. And you sometimes hear this from mischievous kids. Why do I need to know this, sir? Because I can just go away and Google it. Um, technological skills, apparently, are the things that are going to be more important. Um, but we, we need to be careful about that argument for several reasons. The first reason is that um, you need knowledge in order to get knowledge. So it's true that kids can go away and Google stuff and look, look things up on Wikipedia. But they won't understand the article at all unless they have some pre-existing knowledge. So that pre-existing knowledge is really critical. It isn't the case that we can just leave kids as blank slates and let them wallow around in the internet knowing nothing and teach themselves, because they don't have the knowledge to get there. The second thing is that people have been saying this for centuries. So when the book came along, people were criticizing books because it would damage people's memories. Yeah? Um, when the wheel came along, etc., 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 there's nothing new about technological change, and we should be resistant to the idea that somehow now this is different. Now we've got the internet, we need to change things. Technology has been changing things uh, for a long, long time. We deceive ourselves if we think we're special. And uh, this is the final thing that I just want to mention. Quite often you hear people talking about uh, 21st century skills as if these are special things that we should be focusing on, just like that video did at the very start, that now we're in the internet age, we should do away with the old stuff and we should just focus on 21st century skills, things like critical thinking, collaboration, communication, and so on. The first thing to say about these is it's incredibly conceited of us to think that somehow we need these skills but they weren't needed in the past. These people needed a huge amount of critical thinking, collaboration, and creativity to pull down the mammoth. Yep. Absolutely. There's nothing different about the world we now live in. Creativity, collaboration, and these 21st century skills, they're not 21st century skills. They're human skills. They're not unique to the 21st century. Uh, the second thing to say about them is that in order to use any of these skills, 
you need something to act on in the first place. So some of you, let's just see, is there anyone here who's a lawyer or a doctor? A, a, a lawyer or a doctor? A doctor. So I know, say, you will be able to be really creative in your field because you've got so much knowledge about your particular field. But if I asked you to get on a pottery wheel and be creative, the results would probably, unless you, it's your hobby, be hilarious. Yeah? Now why is that? It's because you can't give people creativity in isolation. They need the knowledge in order to use that creativity. They need something for it to act on. So if you took from that video at the start, the stills of the video at the start, that we as a school should be teaching creativity just on its own, then I, I take issue with that because knowledge is critical. You can't um, be creative unless you have a background in knowledge. Uh, and the third thing is that I just want to say here is sometimes you hear people say, um, oh yeah, what we should be doing now is we should be teaching people on cutting edge stuff. So we should be walking around with VR masks on. Everyone should have an iPad or whatever it is. iPads are slightly out of date. And that will set people up for the future. Yeah? Now you all look far too young for this. But when I was at school, people were saying the same about that. Absolute height of technology. This is the future. And it hasn't turned out to be the future at all. It's turned out to be the past. So the point there is these, the, the kind of traditional knowledge is still going to be what children need for the modern world because VR masks are going to look terribly out of date, possibly in three years' time. So unless they have that background of um, quite traditional knowledge, they're just going to know how to operate an out-of-date piece of technology. Just as I know how to operate an out-of-date piece of technology, I can program in BBC Basic. It's absolutely useless to me. Yeah? Um, but at the time, my teacher thought that he was really imparting cutting-edge information to me. And it turned out that he wasn't. More useful was the uh, tr more traditional knowledge that we got at school. Um, so this really just makes the point that there's a, a difference here in when I'm talking about knowledge and information. And again, this harks back to that idea that you can't really go on the internet and find stuff out. You can find information out, but if you don't know the crucial links between that information and other pieces of information, it's just isolated nugget, nuggets of pub facts, and it does you no good. So we need to guide children more towards knowledge and explain the difference between knowledge and just being able to pluck out information on the internet. It has, of course, got really difficult. So this shows the size of the data sphere, the amount of stuff that's held out there on the internet since just 2010, so not long ago. And it's skyrocketing all the time at an exponential rate. So there's loads and loads of it in the modern world. And um, it's now true, of course, that a world-famous scientist like Richard Dawkins, he's the author of The Selfish Gene and, uh, and things like that. Um, incredibly knowledge knowledgeable guy, only knows a tiny, tiny fraction of all that there is to know. Whereas Newton, it is said, knew virtually everything about science in his time. Yeah? So what was known about the workings of the physical world, Newton knew almost everything, whereas now, um, even the best scientists in the world only know a tiny fraction of, uh, of knowledge. So, what's this got to do with making children cleverer? I think this really sums it up, that a broad, knowledge-rich curriculum, which covers the best of what's been thought and said, is the most important thing through, for nav navigating through life. Not trying to teach creativity in isolation, not trying to make people more empathetic in isolation, um, not trying to, or not getting obsessed with uh, showing people technology that will soon be outdated. I'm not saying we should have no technology in schools, but we should be humble about it. This is what we're using at the moment, kids. It'll be different in your time, but the principles and the knowledge that you're learning now will be what you act on when the new things come out. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's really a summary of that particular bit. So now we get into the difficult issue of, okay, if it's knowledge that is so important, how are we going to choose what we actually teach? And isn't it a bit convenient that most of the knowledge that we seem to be teaching has all been spewed out by people like me, Westerners, not by me, I should stress, but people who look like me, yeah? White, male, 
old, male and stale, they're sometimes called. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah I, can, I can well see how people react a little bit against this. But there's a couple of things that I would say. Um, you need to know about this stuff in order to be able to reject it and build on it and add to it yourself. Yeah? And there's, certain, um, there's a definite cultural capital in knowing about these famous names and uh, whether you're Thai or from the UK or wherever you are and if you're not taught those because your teacher is a bit of a kind of woke crusader they're doing you a disservice what right have they to deny you knowledge of the best that has been written down wrought and said, written and said because they don't believe that uh, white males should have had the platform in the first place yeah? They're depriving you of something which you will never then be able to react against. Um, the other thing is that it's not really a problem in this school because people pay to come here and uh, uh, there's a kind of lower bar beneath which people can't fall. But for the, the people in the Thai schools out there or in the uh, UK state uh, education system, um, access to this old pale and stale knowledge is the key to getting on in life. So if you deny people who haven't got much money access to this kind of cultural knowledge you're basically keeping them poor you, so you think you're helping them by being incredibly modern and not teaching them because it was said by old white men but you're doing them a massive disservice because they then won't be able to access any of the institutions um, which they might be able to use to, to help them out of poverty so it's, it's really really sad when I see people well-meaning trying to say that's not the knowledge we should be teaching because that is the knowledge that is required to um, get on in society. Um, sometimes people say, well, we should be teaching new stuff, and I just want to introduce this uh, Lindy effect here. The Lindy effect basically says that the longer an idea has been circulating around, the more useful it is. Yeah? Now, if you think about that, ideas that are just plain wrong or not useful, no one passes them on. But ideas that are useful and help you unlock things, they're the things that get passed on. So when we're deciding about what we should be teaching, we should be teaching these ideas that have been around for a long time, have never been debunked, yeah, are part of the canon of human knowledge which needs to be passed on to the future. Coming up with new stuff is likely to be dangerous because it could quickly drop off as uh, unuseful. Yeah? So world-class curriculum is unlikely to be radically different in content from a, a traditional one, um, particularly because there are only so many hours in the school day. So if you decide you're going to teach one thing, you're deciding not to teach something else. OK, so now we're going to get on to a bit of, uh, about how the brain works and, and what this, uh, the impact is on this for intelligence. I need to make a distinction here between biologically primary knowledge and biologically pr uh, secondary knowledge. So biologically primary knowledge is things like learning to walk, learning to talk. Or whether the child is taught that or not, they will get it. It's biologically primary. We're evolved to learn that stuff really, really quickly. Yeah? And it includes things like learning, if you touch something, to, you know, the reflex to, to come away and not then to do it again. That's learning. Yeah? Um, and it happens naturally and no explicit instruction is required. And kids find this easy. They just do it. So that's kind of good news for us as teachers and parents. We don't need to really put that much effort in, in those things. But then there are lots of other things which will help children access society, which they find much harder because they're not biologically primary. And if you just let a child to its own devices, they won't learn these things automatically. So reading is a good example. It doesn't matter how long a child stares at a book, unless you actively teach them how to read, they're not going to read, uh, learn how to read. So it won't happen without, uh, without effort. What's really interesting is uh, an experiment was done on uh, teaching. So teaching some primary age kids how to do something, how to make a puzzle. puzzle and then asking those primary age kids to teach another set of primary age kids how to make the puzzle. And they just filmed this with no interference from the teachers. And um, the kids naturally did things like showed them, showed the new students how to do it, questioned them to check that they knew where the pieces went, confirmed and instructed them. So teaching in itself is a biologically primary thing 
which kind of makes sense. We've evolved to naturally, without really being need, need to be told how to do it, to naturally teach other people how to do things. Obviously our children, but other people as well. Uh, it questions really, doesn't it, whether um, all that effort put into uh, teacher training colleges is actually totally necessary because it's a biologically primary thing. We know how to do it. Um, okay, so what does it mean to be clever? Um, it boils down to these things, I think, two of which we don't really have any control over. So I very much believe as a teacher that we can make children cleverer. Otherwise, what on earth is the point? But there are two things that we don't really have uh, much control over because you're born with a certain ability. So one is your speed of information, uh, information processing. Some people are quick and some people are slow. And your ability to come up with solutions to new problems. Some people have quite a, a good ability at that and some people don't. But look at all of the things that we can change as teachers and parents um, to make children cleverer. So we can change their attitudes to work and the world, which is why um, there's a lot of work going on at the moment on these things, these uh, behaviours in HPL in this school. Those kind of behaviours are going to help children make themselves cleverer. We can, as I've been going on a, a lot about, we can increase their... What is HPL? <laughs> oh, HPL is the High Performance Learning, yeah, uh, which the school is going through at the moment in the process of getting accredited, yeah, High Performance Learning. Um, we can increase their knowledge, what they think about. We can increase their memory. We can help them increase their memory size. And we can uh, help them with what I'm terming their habits of mind. So I'm going to go through each of these and just look at what we can do as parents and teachers to increase the capacity of each of these aspects of being clever or intelligent that we've got a lever on that we can change. Um, one more little thing to talk about is that uh, there's a difference here between fluid and crystallised intelligence and what we can target here is uh, crystallised intelligence, so accumulated knowledge and, and information over a lifetime, education dependent. This stuff is the red stuff really that we don't have that much control over um, and it's inherited. So we can't do that much about that but we can do a lot about that. And I put this up at the top because it's, it's interesting that over time it seems that people have just got more intelligent. It's quite a scary thing, this. So this shows you the bell curve for a given human population taken in 1932 and the bell curve taken a lot later in 1997 and it will have moved even further. It does seem that intelligence tests as a measure of intelligence demonstrate that you are better at intelligence tests than maybe your grandparents were or your great-grandparents were and so on. And then all sorts of uh, th reasons have been put forward for that. But I think it's easiest if we, if we compare uh, our own intelligence, say, with the intelligence of people who were living in the Middle Ages. We will do better on intelligence tests. And intelligence tests are testing abstract things, if you've ever done one, like putting shapes together in your head and seeing how they will come together. If you're a farmer, tending your cattle and worrying about where your food tends to come from, you're not going to worry about those kind of problems. And so you've never had any practice on them. You know, you've never been formally educated in that way. So it may well be that you're very clever, but you, you do badly on intelligence tests because you can't think in that way, because your main object is simply staying alive. Whereas everyone in this room has never really worried about where their next meal is coming from. So they're much more, uh, they've been taught these abstract problems, and they're thinking in an abstract way much more often. So on intelligence tests, we do better than our ancestors did on similar style tests. Okay, so um, habits of mind. These are like little um, mental tricks that you need in different subjects to get good at them. Um, a good example is with crosswords. Cross crosswords are in two types, really. One where you, you get a simple clue that's a, a word or a place and you write it down. But then there are the more uh, tricky types, the cryptic crosswords. 
And um, I don't know whether you have these in Thai papers, but in the UK papers at the back, there's an easy crossword and there's a hard crossword. The hard crossword is usually the cryptic crossword. And if you try and do it and you've not been trained in these habits of mind, you won't get any of the clues. Yeah? And you can't really self-teach. Someone has to show you how those clues work. Otherwise, you just can't do it. So there are anagrams, words mixed up. Yeah? There are hidden words, letter clues, all sorts of different things. Homophones, where one word sounds exactly like another and so on. Doesn't matter how much you practice on that, you won't get anywhere unless you know the tricks. So to make people cleverer, more intelligent, better at solving those problems, what we need to do is to model the solutions, talk them through the process, teach them basically the formal mental tricks in order to solve those problems. And the same goes for my subject, computer science. Um, there are little tricks that are used in computer science in all languages. And you're not born knowing these things, so there are loops where you get a program to go round and round and round. There are decision trees where you get a program to do one thing if a certain set of conditions is met, and another thing if another set of conditions is met, and you can have another and another and another, and you need to be taught how to do that. Now, once you know those habits of mind, they apply to any language in computing. So you can move from Python to C++ to JavaScript, um, and those habits of mind go with you. They work on all those different languages. And the same with uh, maths problems. There are techniques that you can use on those maths problems that really help you um, solve other things. Um, the suggestion, though, from David Didal is that we shouldn't waste too much time focusing on these habits of mind because it is still, even knowing that, is still more useful to help children expand their knowledge base. Um, the next thing that we can change, if you remember back to that uh, diagram, is uh, children's values and attitudes. Um, but we need to be a little bit careful about this um, because, if you remember, a lot of these are biologically primary. So it's going to be hard to do these things. And it's a shocking fact that uh, parents actually have very little impact on some of these things. Um, roughly half of the differences between how we turn out is attributable to our genes and half to our peers rather than to our parents. Approximately none to the way that we were raised. I find this interesting in our context as an international school because um, some of you will speak with a, a heavy Thai accent, as you should. You live in Thailand and you're Thai. But when I talk to your children, they don't have that accent at all. And I'm left wondering, how on earth is that possible that the two people who brought you into this world and who live with you 24-7 haven't imparted their accent to you? And the reason is, and it's shocking for us as parents, I'm a parent as well, is that the biggest impact on those children isn't you, it's their peer group. So this is really, really significant for me as an educator. We need to really leverage as much as we can the peer group in which the children operate and change the culture or keep the culture positive. So the culture needs to be one in which hard work is valued, in which being honest is valued, because they're going to take it much more from their peers than they are from you or from me as adults. Uh, language just being one visible example of the truth of that statement, that peer group influences are critical in honing... Um, these values and attitudes. There's only a, so much we can do as adults. We, we're going to try and craft, if you like, the pupil culture to help the kids get it right. And so we can make a difference. We need to set the culture. Definitely, I think, the culture that we say to kids, you can make yourself cleverer. It's possible for you to do it. Don't assume, oh, I was, I, I was born stupid because of my parents and there's nothing I can do. No, look at all the things that we can change about you to make you cleverer. That's part of the culture. And if their friends are saying that and they're saying it in lessons, it will uh, be self-fulfilling. We want to be really careful to praise effort and not ability. Yeah? So some kids are really good at things, but we should praise their effort rather than their ability so that they get used to stretching themselves and um, 
you know, really, really firming up those uh, neurons in their head, which come from things being difficult. And um, obviously, trying harder is an aspect of it, but we need to do this really intelligently. So if we say try harder, try harder, and they keep failing, we're doing it wrong. We need to go back and say, uh, have the necessary uh, support to be successful in the first place. It's no good giving children a problem that is too hard and saying try harder and try harder and they just keep failing because that obviously will result in them getting demoralized. So here it comes in a really important uh, concept in teaching and in parenting really that where there is a problem that is difficult we need to provide them with support just like scaffolding. We can refer to it as scaffolding actually and the scaffolding analogy is really great because no one puts scaffolding up and then expects it to stay there. Yeah? The whole point of scaffolding is it enables you to get somewhere where you could never have got on your own, but then it comes off. Yeah? So when we're helping children with uh, difficult problems, um, we make sure that we help them with the scaffolding. It's still difficult even with the scaffolding. It's still scary up there. Yeah? So the scaffolding doesn't make it so easy that you're not really going anywhere, otherwise there's no point. And um, we make the costs of failure nothing. Yeah? Scaffolders these days are roped in. If they fall off, they just get back on. Yeah? And we should do that here as well. Uh, and you as parents, if they muck things up, there's no negative consequence. So they're not scared to try. Yeah? Um, and they all grow. And we can also help them with their memory. Okay? Um, Really, really interesting research has been done on memory. That, and I, I did another talk on this, actually, one of my earlier talks was on memory. The human uh, capacity for memorizing things is basically limitless. The size of your long-term memory, long-term memory I'm talking about here, is basically limitless. Um, but keep harking on about this. Knowledge plays a role in memory. This chess game being an example, if you've never seen a chess board before and I asked you to memorize where those pieces were, It'd be a very, very difficult task because you have to memorize all of the shapes and the individual location of all of the shapes. But most of you in the room won't have much difficulty with memorizing those chess pieces because you know where most of them are already because you know how a chessboard is set up. These are just in their normal positions. So all of that you cannot bother putting into your short-term memory. Um, and again, this kind of harks back to that importance of knowledge. The more knowledge we give children, and the more we put that knowledge into their long-term memory, the easier we make it for them to work on hard problems, because they don't need to clog up their short-term memory with remembering stuff. They know it already, yeah? You do not need to remember any of that bit of the chessboard, because you just know it. So when the exam paper comes, you can just fill that bit in, yeah? And that's uh, a large part of what we're trying to help children with in terms of their memory. We're going to be building up their knowledge to limit the strain on their short-term memory. Um, just a little bit on memory here and how it works. Um, your short-term memory, uh, which is uh, this part here of this diagram, is li really limited in capacity, Pro probably only seven digits in most people. If I asked you to remember a number longer than seven digits, you'd find it pretty hard. Unless I do a little mental trick with you and I get you to remember dates or numbers that you already know and then you can remember the number that you already know and then you can remember another number that you already know and so on. And that's, that's called chunking and it works really well. Um, but look at this. Um, the long-term memory, which is equivalent to a computer's ROM, is, is totally unlimited. No one's really found the limit of human memory. And um, once it's in there, it, it lasts a lifetime. Yeah? So we're trying to, uh, learning really, definition is moving stuff into the contents of children's long-term memory. There's nothing we can do to expand their short-term memory, so the only thing we can do is try and get stuff in there so they don't have to use up their short-term memory. A um, little bit more on this, <coughs> the um, actual components of the short-term memory. These are the different components. This is to do with hearing, this is to do with seeing stuff. And it seems that you can hear and see stuff and not be limited by that seven uh, digit value. So you can kind of cheat the short-term memory to cram quite a lot into it. 
And this is a really important point for teachers. You can help children by showing them something visually and telling it. Yeah? Because they're getting it in two places and you can cram it in then and it will help them remember stuff. So um, that's kind of uh, dual coding of information. It's really, really helpful for kids. And in my lessons, I'm always trying to remember that. I need to show them this so they can see it and tell them it. And then there's more chance that uh, they will remember it, store it in their long-term memory, and um, away it will go. So those points about memory, um, we need to be careful as teachers and parents that we don't overload them with too much too many complicated instructions. So quite often when teachers are trying to teach children a new topic, they'll come up with a kind of fun and exciting way of doing it. And what you find is that the kids are more occupied with the fun and exciting way of doing it than with the actual thing that you want them to learn. So unfortunately what's happened in that situation is their short-term memory is being clogged up with the fun of the exercise. And the actual stuff that you want them to learn, they haven't got any space for it, so it doesn't get learnt. So keeping things really simple and remembering that short-term memory is limited is, is really important. Also need to be aware that we might have stuff in our long-term memories that the children don't. So it might be easy for us to think about a certain thing because most of it is stored in our long-term memory. But if it's not in theirs, they're going to really struggle. So the first step is getting them the knowledge into their long-term memory so that they can get to the same place as us. Otherwise, they're never going to learn it. Um, we should exploit wherever we can these opportunities for dual coding. See here, see here, see here. And it's really helpful for them when they're learning. Yep. Um, the episodic buffer, which is this part of the short-term memory, um, makes links between stuff that they already know and new stuff. And that is really, really important. So, Analogies and parables are very useful for this. If they already know a story or they already know a shape or something like that, and you can use that as uh, an analogy or a, a kind of mental hook for learning new knowledge, that really, really helps children. So that's what that point is making. Exploit the opportunities for saying, you already know this, and look, this is similar. And then you've helped them nudge it into their long-term memory. Um, f the final point really is that, um, yeah, we need to keep things simple. If we're teaching them new concepts, that's probably not the time to make it whiz-bang fun. Oh, the headmaster might be coming in to observe this lesson, so I must make sure that they look like they're really enjoying it. Because although that might be great, they might not actually be learning anything. So. Some of those lessons where a lot is done are lessons where the teacher is really explicitly and quietly instructing children on the steps to take to move uh, through the task. Yeah. See the dual coding here? We've got it written down and we've got an image. It really helps the children uh, internalize stuff. Yeah, so I guess this is the point here about um, teaching styles. We've got two teachers. One teacher, every lesson is outstanding, huge amount of fun, all the kids say, oh, I love that teacher, he's so great. Yeah. Um, yet he, or she, assumes that all the content that has been learnt, each lesson has been learnt, and then just goes on to the next uh, lesson. This teacher, lessons are so-so, yeah, but keeps going back over the material to check that the children have internalised it. And actually, the, the learning is best with this teacher as opposed to this teacher, okay? Because this teacher is exploiting the fact that things quickly get forgotten, go back over them, get forgotten, go back over them, get forgotten, go back over them. But you notice that the amount getting forgotten each time is reducing, yeah? Um, the other thing that we now do in all our subjects is we try and divide them up. So traditionally, and this is how it was for me at school, you do one topic, done. Next topic, done. Next topic, done. Massive exam at the end on all topics. Yeah? Well, I've completely forgotten this topic. <laughs> yeah? Much better is to do 
Little bit of topic one, little bit of topic three, four, so on, and then come back. You see, we keep revisiting things. And that helps children get stuff into that long-term memory where they won't forget it. Um, and then lastly, my favorite, knowledge and information. So we can do masses here as a school to make children clever in this respect. It's the quantity and quality of what we know that to a large extent determines how clever we are. It is knowledge. It, it really is that simple. This is the golden key. Okay? Good news for us is that um, compare these two babies. This one was lucky. It was born with a high level of acuity and fast information processing, which are things we can't change. It was just born that way. This child was unlucky. It wasn't born with those things. But it doesn't matter because we can level things up. Yeah? Your school and your home life, the amount of information that you have passed on to you, the amount of revisiting, the amount of diligent teachers checking your understanding uh, helps you. So despite the genetic disadvantages that this child had, he could end up being the cleverer one in the end because he had more knowledge. Yeah. Uh, yes, so what you know determines what you learn. The more knowledge you have, the more connections you can make between different aspects of that knowledge. The more connections you can make, the more ways you can access that knowledge and, and use it in your life. So your brain looks like this, as opposed to looking like this. Yeah? Okay, so I'm just going to whiz through a few little things by, written by a guy called uh, Barak Rosenshine, who was a professor at Illinois just going over the things that we can do to make sure that we're imparting as much knowledge as possible. So you've seen that reviewing material is really, really important. We mustn't assume, as we sometimes do, that we've taught something and that's it. It will be forgotten. Yeah? So we should teach something and go over it every day, every week. And the test should be relatively hard. It should be hard for the children to get that information back out because the effort in getting it back out strengthens the synapse. Yeah. So there's going to be a little bit of complaining. Oh, I've forgotten it, sir, I've forgotten it. You need to try and dig it out. Because once you've dug it out, it'll be easier next time, and then it'll be easier, and it'll be easier, and it'll be easier. Yeah? So review, definitely. I'm questioning. The, the wonderful thing about Barrett Rosenshine is he talks about teachers not in terms of being good and bad, which is in kind of quite judgmental, and it demoralizes the bad teachers. He talks about them being as effective and less effective. And effective teachers use lots and lots of questioning. And they use questioning in a really interesting way. They don't just ask the student for the answer. They ask the student, how did you get that answer? Yeah, really probing questions. What was your thought process in giving me that answer? And if this child doesn't know, they then use the fact of their not knowing to teach them it again to make sure that they do know it. So several reasons for questioning. First of all, it helps the students thinking, but secondly, it helps the, uh, the teacher find out what they do and don't know. Um, we should sequence and model things. Remember the cognitive overload. If you give people too much information in one go, rather like I maybe think I might be doing here, if you give people too much information in one go, they just go, oh, I can't cope with it, and they, they don't learn anything. So we've got to do really small steps, break it down for people, guide them. Remember that scaffolding, we're going to help them uh, with problems initially. And then bit by bit, the scaffolding is going to come away. It's never the intention that the scaffolding stays there forever. And we're going to build on prior knowledge. We're going to use analog analogies. Um, we're going to do everything that we can to reduce that feeling of stress so that they've got uh, the opportunity to... Uh, try out new things in their head. And we're going to practice, 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 practice. Some of that practice is going to be closely guided by the teacher, with the teacher right by their side helping them. And some of that practice is going to be on their own in the evenings. And unfortunately for them, they do need this, particularly as they get older. Okay? Uh, they need a lot of uh, practice to make sure that that stuff is being converted into their long-term memory. And this, this is quite important for you, for you to know as parents. The practice should um, result in a relatively high success rate. If they're failing all the time in the practice, they're going to get demoralized. And research has shown that about 80% is the sweet spot. If they're, if they're practicing and they're getting 100% all the time, there's no point in doing it. Yeah? It's too easy. 
So they should be getting about 80% of it correct, and that shows that it's right in the sweet spot of where their uh, knowledge is at the moment. Difficult enough for them to fail sometimes and the teacher then to be able to show them how to improve, but not so difficult that they get demoralized and they feel they don't noth know, know nothing, and not so easy that the teacher can't help them because they just get everything right all the time. And there they are all together, but we shouldn't do these as a list. It's, it's damaging if we say, oh, all right, every teacher should be doing these every lesson. That's never how they were intended to be used. But teachers and parents should know about these and they should use them where appropriate yeah, with their children. And finally, so why does all this matter? What difference does it make? Um, don't we just want children to be happy? Absolutely, yes we do. <laughs> yes we do. But if we look at the uh, bell curve for IQ scores, it is true that if you're over on the right-hand side of this bell curve, unbelievably, you live longer. Why do you live longer if you're cleverer? Yeah, there's all sorts of reasons for that. I'll let you think about that. But you live longer if you're cleverer. You're good at lots of the things that you do. So intelligence is general. Yeah? If you're good at some things, it's likely that you'll be good at others as well. You're better at coping with what life throws up. So if there's a massive setback, you lose your job, your wife leaves you, you're better at coping with those things if you're over on the right-hand side of this. You're likely to be more creative that's where you're asked to sort of uh, um, given a shape and asked to say how could that shape be made into a table or something like that those divergent tasks they're called um, you're better at those so we haven't taught you creativity but by giving you more knowledge we've pushed you over to the right of this bell curve you're likely to be a better leader etc etc look at all these things that you're likely to be better at if you are on the right side of this bell curve you're likely to be more physically and mentally fit you're likely to stay in education for longer. You're likely to register more patents, believe it or not. Uh, receive more artistic awards. So, so one critique of these has been, oh yeah, well if you're focusing on this all the time, what about the artists? But actually these people are more artistic as well. Uh, you're likely to be happier and you're li less likely to commit a violent crime or be a victim of one. I mean, isn't that amazing? You'd have thought your intelligence would make no difference to the likelihood of you being whacked over the head with a hammer. But it does, yeah? If you're more intelligent, you are less likely to be the victim of a violent crime. And that is it. So thank you very much. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. And if anyone does have any questions they, uh, that they'd like the audience to hear, you're welcome to ask me one. Or you may want to do it on your own afterwards, I, don't, I really don't mind. But thank you so much for listening. Yeah. We could not argue against the fact that uh, all of these things is end up depend on each teacher quality and ability, and which is different across the board in, in the school. For example, in, this, in one level, you have five rooms, and each teacher is have a different experience, is have a different ability, and have a different effort. As you told in the slide, that uh, one teacher might be different than another teacher, am I correct? So, unluckily, if some student always get the, the bottom of the line teacher in every single year, well, yes. I mean, that, that all teachers are not the same. But what I would say about uh, what we do here is this kind of stuff. The things that make teachers more effective. We're telling our teachers all the time. These are the techniques that you need to use. And we're better than any school I've ever worked in, actually, at identifying the teachers who are less effective. No one here, no one here makes the children worse. Yeah? <laughs> but there, there are people whose uh, children progress at a slower rate, definitely. Um, if that happens, loads of support is put in. And then ultimately, and this does sometimes happen, uh, their contract isn't renewed and things like that. So, I mean, if you, please, if you've got any concerns about a specific teacher, then you must let us know. The, the likelihood is, of course, that we will already know because we're continually monitoring the progress that children make and we can see if they're making less progress in one class than the other. In which case, that teacher has got lots of support in there, uh, they're being told why they're slightly less effective. They're being shown new techniques for being more effective. Um, 
I, but the, the one other thing that I would say is that, as I showed you on that slide, we, we have to be really careful that we don't assume that teacher popularity with parents or with kids means that the teacher is good. Because sometimes a really popular teacher is actually not very effective. The kids love them, yeah? But, um, yeah, if you actually look at their knowledge, it's not, not uh, increasing very much. And there, might, there are teachers who the kids oh, don't like their lessons, <laughs> but they're really good, yeah? They're really good. So, and we know that. We know that as well, yeah. And you've seen that. I definitely know. Yeah. So it's not a popularity contest, <coughs> absolutely. And of course, it is possible, and this particularly happens further up the school, where children realise, look, his lessons are hard, or hers, but I like him because we learn a lot. You hear that? <coughs> Sorry. In the, in the uh, younger year groups, kids obviously, they just want to have fun. And so sometimes, <coughs> sorry, I'm dying here. Sometimes they mistake having fun for learning a lot. But the older the children get, <coughs> the more self-aware they get, the more they realise, yeah, his lessons are no fun, but oh, by God, we learn a lot in them. Yeah? And it's possible to be fun and learn a lot. But I don't think it's possible to be fun all the time and learn a lot. I think sometimes the lesson just has to be hard. Otherwise, the children don't learn. <laughs> Did that uh, answer your question? And, and remember that uh, you must uh, come and see us if you... Uh, I, may, I re kind of sense behind that question you had concerns maybe about a teacher, in which case, let us know. Which goes for all of you. Yeah. You're the customers here. If you, think, uh, if you think progress isn't being made, then let us know. Yeah. Yeah. We try not to be picky. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's your view on Um, so, it's really, really, really tough, this one. Um, and I can see advantages on both sides. I actually think that it is subject dependent. So, uh, maths being a really, really good example. Um, because in maths, you're dealing with aspects of intelligence that are, uh, if I just go back to the necessary slide, in maths, uh, uh, let's just get back to it. Yeah. In maths, these things are at a real premium. And children are either born with them or not. And it's not particularly their fault. And if you have children who are incredible at these things with children who aren't, it may well be that they get to, thank you. It may well be that they eventually get to the same level. You saw the, that, uh, you know, this, this isn't damning children to be always in the lower set, they can improve, they can improve, but I definitely think that in maths, children who are very good with these things will be held back if they are with children who are not, and the children who are not will be disadvantaged because they need more scaffolding and help um, in order to get up to the same level. So the best approach to this, I think, is to have a school where there is setting in things like maths, as we have here, but that the expectations are rough, sky high, whichever set you're in. So if your child is in the bottom set, that's not, oh, he's in the bottom set, so we'll make sure he gets a D. No, he's in the bottom set, so we're going to give him loads of scaffolding and help. We're going to slowly remove the scaffolding, but we're fully expecting him to get an A as well. Um, so it's about the expectations. So I think setting, particularly in maths, and um, high expectations. When you get further up the school, setting is just not possible anyway because of the set size. So when you get to A-level, we can't have sets in the same way because of the way people choose. You just couldn't do the timetable like that without making the school ridiculously expensive. Do you see what I mean? So if you offer children geography at A level in a certain uh, part of the timetable, 10 of them choose geography, which is a great set size. Yeah? If you wanted setting, we would maybe have to have two or three sets for 10. Each set would only have three or four people in it. First of all, it's not very nice teaching a set that small. 
um, because you get more class discussion and so on if it's a large set. And secondly, it just economically, uh, it's wasteful. Yeah, that's almost one to three teaching, and although the fees here are quite high, they would be even higher uh, in that situation. So, no school anywhere in the world that I know of has setting at A level just for that reality, including in maths, because it's not possible. Yeah. Um, maths often gets a lot of people choosing it. So there's sometimes opportunity for setting, but only, only two or maybe three, so not proper setting like we'd get normally where you've got eight different sets. Yeah. A rather lengthy answer, but yeah. Any, any other questions? Otherwise I should let you go. Thank you so much for listening to me. It's sad that it's my last one. Um, have a really nice day. Thank you. Yeah. She was in your class before. Oh, prim. Yeah, I'm not sure yeah, if you yeah, remember. Prim, prim. Yeah, 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 she had a good Computing, time. yeah. Yes, yeah, she yeah. had a good time. Hope not too much fun. Having some advantage. She loved her. Did you hear that you are leaving too? Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. yes, yes.